the summer of 1940, and Germany has just won stunning successes in the invasions of Poland, Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. However, for the Kriegsmarine, it has proved to be costly. Losing one heavy cruiser, two light cruisers, ten destroyers, six U-boats, and the two battleships of the Scharnhorst class were damaged in subsequent operations. The Panzerschiff Lutzow, formerly the Deutschland, was severely damaged by a torpedo. The heavy cruiser Prince Eugen was damaged as well, requiring repairs. Effectively, the only German surface vessel available for commerce raiding operations was the Admiral Hipper, with the exception of the German Hilfskreuzes or armed merchant ships. However, the conquest of France would give the Kriegsmarine access to the French Atlantic ports of Brest and Saint-Nazaire, changing the strategic position in the North Atlantic, allowing for any commerce raiders in the Atlantic to use these ports. Due to the losses in Norway, Admiral Erich Rede was limited in the ships that he could choose to send into the Atlantic to raid Allied commerce. Still, the Panzerschiff Admiral Scheer had nearly completed her month-long post-refit exercises in the Baltic and was to be ready by October 1940 for a sortie into the Atlantic, where she would have her eventual battle with the armed merchant cruiser HMS Jarvis Bay. Admiral Scheer left Gottenhofen, or today Gdynia, on the 23rd of October and headed west for Kiel picking up supplies and orders. Captain Theodor Kranka maneuvered his vessel to avoid the British submarine patrol operating the mouth of the Skagerrak, slipping into the North Sea on the 27th of October, and briefly entering Norwegian waters to wait for a weather front to cover his breakout the following day. The ship snuck through British reconnaissance flights and made her way north through the Norwegian Sea. Eventually, Kranka steered his ship northwest around Iceland. By Friday the 31st, he passed through the Denmark Strait without being detected, entering the North Atlantic following the eastern coast of Greenland, sticking close to the seasonal pack ice before making his way south to the latitude of Cape Farewell, intending to prey on the Halifax-Britain convoy route. With the British being none the wiser that there was a German cruiser in the Atlantic, her sudden appearance would be a big shock to the ship she would encounter. At 2.30 on Wednesday the 5th of November, she came across the freighter SS Mopan, she was assumed to be a straggler of a nearby convoy, when, in reality, she was a lone ship sailing from the Caribbean to Britain. The Mopan would be stopped, and the crew taken onto the Admiral Scheer, and then sunk using the Admiral Scheer's secondary 15cm guns. The ship was not the prize that Kranka and his crew were looking for, as German intelligence suggested that there was a convoy nearby. So as soon as the Mopan finally sank at 4.05, the cruiser would take off in pursuit of what turned out to be Convoy HX-84. Convoy HX-84 set off from Halifax on October 28, 1940, consisting of 37 merchant vessels and several old destroyers who returned to Canada after a short time, leaving the armed merchant cruiser HMS Jarvis Bay to protect the convoy. The ships ranged in size, origin, and cargo, from large liners to small steamers. There were 25 British ships, 4 Norwegian, 4 Swedish, 2 Belgian, 2 Polish, and 1 Greek. Their cargo included chemicals, food, timber, wool, and even aircraft. Before continuing, we should discuss Jarvis Bay, who will have quite the duel with the Admiral Scheer. She was a passenger liner built for the Commonwealth Line in the 1920s, aiming to make passage to Australia easier. It was built in the United Kingdom and bought by the White Star Line in 1928. She was converted into a mixed-use ship during her time with the White Star Line and their subsidiary corporations. But in 1939, she and other large liners were converted into armed merchant cruisers for convoy escort duty. The Royal Navy not having enough cruisers and other vessels to provide a full escort for each convoy to protect against raiders like the Admiral Scheer or the Hilfskoises, and especially the submarines. Seeing how the Jarvis Bay didn't have armor or little compartmentalization, cork and empty barrels would be used in the ship to help improve buoyancy, being armed with seven single six-inch guns taken from old decommissioned ships. She helped to escort other convoys before being assigned to Convoy HX-84. Convoy HX-84's 37 merchant vessels were arrayed in nine columns and five rows. It was essentially a big rectangle, almost five miles wide and a mile and a half deep. The Jarvis Bay was at the center of the convoy on the 5th of November, 1940, being only two days away from a destroyer escort for the final leg of the journey to the United Kingdom. For the convoy in HMS Jarvis Bay, danger was spotted from the northwest sometime past 4 p.m., with smoke being spotted by the SS Briarwood. Because it was too far to tell whether it was friend or foe, the Jarvis Bay peeled away from the convoy to investigate. By 4.20 p.m., a ship of some kind could be seen from the bridge of HMS Jarvis Bay. 
Captain Fagan assumed it was British as he had not received any word of a German raider in the Atlantic. With the range closing to 15 nautical miles between the Jarvis Bay, making 12 knots, and the Admiral Scheer, 28. From the perspective of the crew of the Admiral Scheer and Kranka, they knew they had spotted the convoy. They were going to see whether or not they could successfully attack it. Ware, taking from Kranka's post-war memoir, Pocket Battleship, the story of the Admiral Scheer, Soon after that came news that swept through the sheer like a breeze over a cornfield. Smoke was sighted again. Not one smudge of smoke this time, but the smoke of four ships, then six ships, and finally more. That was the convoy, all right. There was excitement on the lower deck, but not on the bridge. Kranka and his officers were as calm and unhurried as though their ship was on peacetime maneuvers. Obviously, with these excerpts, take them with a grain of salt, as with other first-hand accounts from people writing after the fact. There doesn't seem to be one, said Lieutenant Peterson. There's only one there that strikes me as having an unusual deck structure for a freighter. Looks like some sort of auxiliary cruiser. His eyes were glued to the ship, which was forging farther and farther ahead of the convoy as though to move in a protected position. Behind her, dozens of ships of the convoy stretched away across the whole southern horizon. As the two ships came closer, Fagin flashed out a request for the approaching ship to identify herself. Kranka ordered the same signal to be flashed back to the Jarvis Bay. Fagin now understood that he was facing an enemy warship and prepared to fight. When at 440, the Jarvis Bay and the Shear were just 12 miles apart. Kranka slowed and turned his ship to port to reveal her true identity. On board the Jarvis Bay, they now truly understood what they were facing, a German Panzer Schiff. Seeing how they were the only ship between the Admiral Shear and the convoy, there was a determination to fight on board the Jarvis Bay. Captain Fagan ordered the convoy to scatter toward the southeast, and then radioed the Admiralty to report the Admiral Shear, sending the message, One battleship bearing 328, distance 12 miles, course 208 from position indicated. The first the British Admiralty knew about a raider being at sea. Only minutes later at 4.42pm, Admiral Shear opened up with her main battery, falling some 200 meters short. Jarvis Bay then turned to port to expose her starboard side, as well as dropping smoke floats to help mask the convoy's escape. These two ships were now locked into a duel, the Jarvis Bay returning fire with four of her six-inch guns, with her shells falling short of the sheer because she was out of effective range. Still, she lacked the sophisticated fire control systems a real warship like that of the Admiral Shear would have. The Admiral Shear straddled her opponent with her next salvo, covering the Jarvis Bay's decks with pieces of shrapnel when the shells hit the sea. The third salvo fired, this time with all the Admiral Shear's main battery, one shell hit near the converted liner's bridge, slicing across her decks. On the next salvo, the Shear hit the Jarvis Bay at least twice, with fires breaking out on the merchant cruiser's splintered decks. The salvo is vividly described by Kranka. On board the Shear, the chief gunnery officer was shouting to make himself heard above the din. The powerful 28-centimeter shells exploded in her deck structures, and soon flames were leaping up. The enemy was on fire, but she was still moving to port, away from the convoy and nearer to the shear. The aim of this daring maneuver was clear. The British captain was trying to force the shear to turn away from the convoy he was guarding, but in this strategy, he was not successful. The shear did not alter course. The Jarvis Bay's less sophisticated optical rangefinder was destroyed. Whatever guns were operable were left to fire individually. The next few minutes saw the ship strike out several more times. As the range was closing, the German 15cm guns engaged the Jarvis Bay as well, and it was on the fifth salvo, according to the German gunners, that the Jarvis Bay was all but torn apart. Survivors of the Jarvis Bay recalled her deck buckling with a blast, and all of her guns would go silent. Due to her lack of armor, the German shells were ripping apart the ship below decks. According to another survivor of the Jarvis Bay, he remembered looking to the destroyed bridge. He saw Captain Fagin with his arm partially severed, giving his final order to abandon the ship. Soon after the order was given, the bridge was covered in flames with Captain Fagin going down with his ship. The Jarvis Bay was listing heavily, and her crew was now carrying out their captain's final order. The Jarvis Bay rolled over and began to sink, taking quite a bit of time to do so, finally sinking fully after sunset. Out of her crew of 254, 68 men would survive being rescued by the Swedish steamer Strulholm. Three would later die of their injuries. Franka wrote after the war, No one on board the Shear knew either the name of the British vessel, it was the Jarvis Bay, or the name of her heroic commander. It was Captain Fagin, Royal Navy. But whoever he was, one thing was clear. 
He had the authentic Nelson touch. He was a man with such authority over his men that they were prepared to follow him to a certain death in a hopeless fight and carry out his orders to the last. While the crew of the Jarvis Bay were abandoning ship, Admiral Shear was racing to pursue the fleeing convoy. Although her radar was temporarily out of action, with darkness rapidly approaching, Cranka felt that he could still fight. Although with destroyers possibly about, and with strict orders to not put his ship at risk of a torpedo attack, Cranka would have to be careful. The Shear's next victim would be the SS Maiden, a freighter that was sunk with all hands. Next, the tanker MV San Dimitro was hit and set on fire, but was able to limp away to safety, eventually making it to the United Kingdom. A story for another time. The Admiral Shear moved on to the Ken Bain Head and Trellward, sinking both. Now, it's important to discuss the SS Beaverford. I will not be discussing her supposed action of engaging the Admiral Shear in a four-hour duel lasting until 1045 when the Admiral Shear finished her off with a torpedo, as I don't want to perpetuate claims that I can't substantiate. However, I will link to a very interesting article that discusses taking facts from myth. Like I always do, I recommend doing your own research and not taking everything you read or hear, including this video, as gospel. But what I can substantiate would be the fact that the Beaverford did take quite a long beating from the Admiral Shear before being sunk. The Admiral Shear only overtook one more freighter, the SS Fresno City, sinking her. Franca, giving up on convoy HX-84, steered his ship south, the next few days being uneventful. On the 12th of November, Admiral Shear rendezvoused with the tanker Eurofeld and the supply ship Nordmark. Franca steered his ship around the South Atlantic and into the Indian Ocean, eventually making it back to Kiel on April 1st, 1941, where I covered this operation in my video on the Admiral Shear in more detail. Link on screen now or in the description. All in all, the Admiral Shear sank or captured 113,622 tons of Allied shipping in her long voyage requiring quite the extensive refit and overhaul once returning to Germany. While the Admiral Scheer was at sea, it gave Admiral Ash Rader the confidence to order more surface raiders into the Atlantic, where Craig L. Simmons in World War II at Sea, A Global History, he writes, Rader believed that the crews of the Admiral Scheer validated his commerce raiding strategy. Franca's success, he wrote, created advantageous preconditions for a new raid by other fleet units. To seize that opportunity, he dispatched the heavy cruiser Admiral Hipper on two raids, one in December 1940 and another in February 1941, though neither were particularly fruitful. He also sent out the Scharnhorst and Neisenau. Over the ensuing three months, January to March 1941, those two sank 21 ships, 16 of them in just two days on March 15th through the 16th, before safely making it to the port of Brest on March 22nd. Again, Rado was pleased declaring that the entire cruise had been singularly successful, especially in causing the Royal Navy to disperse its assets. Nevertheless, the actions of the Jarvis Bay and the other ships of Convoy HX-84 should be recognized as a valiant effort against the odds. Captain Fagan was posthumously awarded a Victoria Cross for his efforts in the battle. Before I go, I should mention that there is a website called the HMS Jarvis Bay Association. Please go check it out. I've used some other stuff before, like in my video on the burial of the Admiral Shear or what remained of the ship. Until next time, my friends, have a great week. Please remember to like and subscribe as it will help the channel to grow.